Welcome to our virtual chat. So today we have with us Karma Snyder, who's from the Space, space Launch or Senate Space Center. And she works on space launch systems that will eventually take people to Mars. So we're really excited about this virtual chat. Before we do get started, I just want to let everyone know that distance learning, so this type of virtual interaction that we're having today, will be happening starting September 4th. So we'll be launching that. If you'd like more information, you can go on to Michigan Science Center's website. We have programs available for third and fourth grade currently, and more will be upcoming. So stay tuned for that. Um, let's get Karma on. So here she is. Hi, Karma. Hello. Can you hear me How okay? We can. Okay. So Karma is speaking with us now, and we'll have questions and answers at the end of the session, okay? Let's get started. Thank you. Hi, my name is Karma Snyder. I'm a system engineer for the Space Launch System Core Stage Testing here at Stena Space Center. Uh, we're going to be testing the entire core stage for the um, SLS program, and that will that testing will actually be starting next year. So we're getting everything geared up for that. I do have a presentation to share with you that has some video in it, and I'll talk about the different areas as we go through that. Oops. Hold on just a second. She's just working on switching to sharing a presentation with us, so that's what's happening now. She didn't cut out. She's still here. Okay. I'm, I'm still here. Uh, can you see the presentation okay? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so this is an artist's conception of the uh, Space Launch System vehicle. Uh, this is basically the, the phases that we're going to go through uh, in our journey getting to Mars. Uh, we have done low Earth orbit missions for quite some time now with the uh, space shuttle, and we continue to do those low Earth orbit missions with the International Space Station. We are going to gradually move towards the moon and a little further out as our proving ground. And then as we move towards more towards Mars, we've actually sent probes and everything already over there. But as we uh, move humans towards Mars, we're going to become more Earth independent. Um, when you're taking a journey in a car cross country or whatever, you're able to pull off on the side of the road and get some extra gas, get some extra snacks. Uh, going from the Earth to Mars, you can't just pull over if you run out of anything. So we have to make sure in the proving ground stage that we have all the technology proven and all of our systems are working correctly so that we can get to Mars safely. So this is going to be the world's most powerful rocket. Uh, you have the solid rocket boosters. There's one on each side. Uh, those solid rocket boosters are very similar to the ones that were on the space shuttle. On the very bottom of the rocket, you have four RS-25 engines. RS-25 is the official designation of the space shuttle main engine. We will have four of those. Then you have the core stage. The core stage holds the hydrogen tank and oxygen tank that fuel those four RS-25 engines. The core stage is what is coming to Stena Space Center to be tested. We will be testing all four engines at the same time. It's going to be incredibly loud. Then there's a stage adapter that connects to the what they call the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. The interim cryogenic propulsion stage holds one RL-10 engine that will propel the Orion capsule with your space travelers out to its destination. So each one of these solid rocket boosters weighs approximately 1.6 million pounds. 
as much as four blue whales, and they each generate 3.6 million pounds of thrust for a total of 7.2 million pounds of thrust for the vehicle. And this is a picture of a solid rocket booster being tested in Utah. We do not test those here at Stennis. Uh, just a short uh, video showing you a little bit about the boosters. This is one of the booster segments being processed at the manufacturer. It's approximately 12 feet in diameter and the entire booster is 17 stories tall. Inside each solid rocket booster, you have uh, a fuel core and that is what's actually burned. These chunks that you see coming out at the beginning of the video there, uh, that's actually a plug to keep other things out until we're ready to fire it. We are able to do a little gimbling with the uh, engine. Uh, basically that's moving it around to uh, steer our vehicle. Now the four RS-25 engines on the core stage, they will generate as much power as 16 Hoover dams. And this is actually a picture of the RS-25 being tested here at Stennis Space Center on our test stand A1. Uh, we have four very large test stands out here and this is one of them. We actually just had an RS-25 test last week. It went very well. This shows you again the four RS-25 engines. Uh, this is the processing facility that's here at Stennis Space Center. It's being rolled out to the test stand. A crane is used to lift it up into the test stand. That circular yellow thing is called our ver vertical engine installer. And that actually places the engine in place so we can button it up into the test stand. And that's uh, one of our tests. The exhaust plume that you're seeing is only superheated steam. Hydrogen and oxygen make steam. Now, this is part of the core stage. This is the hydrogen tank. It's 200 feet long for the entire core stage. Uh, this is at the Michoud Assembly Facility just outside of New Orleans. I've actually seen uh, this uh, machine that the tank is being built on, it's, um, it's incredible. The, each one of these segments for these tanks is individually welded together. This is the oxygen tank right here. And it's, uh, it's carefully moved into place. This is the hydrogen tank being built. The hydrogen tank and the oxygen tank will be delivered to Stennis uh, together before testing. And this segment right here is called the, um, the engine section. This is where the four RS-25s will be housed um, on that vehicle. As I mentioned earlier, we have a connection, you could call it a ring. Uh, it's a little more conical, but this is the, uh, this is the launch vehicle stage adapter. This connects the core stage to the Orion capsule. The Orion capsule, that's where all the astronauts will be sitting. So you see the engine right there, that's gonna be covered by this adapter piece. This shows the adapter be piece being welded together. That's a very special welding tool, very precise. If you notice inside, there's uh, looks like a honeycomb kind of effect inside there. Uh, that makes the material strong, but very lightweight. And there's the actual stage adapter for the Orion capsule also being built. So 
So in building this, um, building this new rocket, we're also using new technologies uh, that will actually benefit other manufacturing areas. We're using uh, composite materials. We are actually using 3D printing to make parts for engines and other components. Um, there's also different um, inspection techniques that are being developed right now so that when we go look at a, a component, we don't have to take it apart to make sure everything is in there correctly. We can use uh, the scanning technique to actually look inside and make sure that everything is exactly where it needs to be. So all these new techniques, all these new technologies are actually going to have flow down capabilities to other manufacturing areas, not just rocket engines. And our, our astronauts who will be traveling to the moon and to Mars and beyond will be traveling in this Orion space capsule. Uh, the, the space launch system is a heavy lift rocket. So it's capable of taking human exploration to deep space and beyond. I have a short video right here. So what we're saying is the adventure begins now. We are starting our journey to, Mar to Mars. Now we have to take it in phase steps. Uh, the other deep space um, adventures that we're planning, we're going to Europa. I believe uh, the launch date is about 2020, 2021. Uh, Europa, we believe has um, an ocean underneath its icy crust. So we want to go check that out. We want to go look at it. Uh, there's also another moon um, called Enceladus. Uh, that one has shown that it has geysers, um, possibly hydrogen in those geysers, which actually may indicate there might be life underneath its icy crust. So this is just incredibly exciting that we're gonna be able to go to those places and just learn more about them. And uh, so the adventure begins now. Oh, thank you so much, Karma. For all that great information, we do have some questions great. Um, from the audience. They will be lined up over here. They wrote down their questions on sheets of paper. Um, did anyone else have a question they wrote down on a sheet of paper? Can you raise their hand for me so I can see that? Right. Um, will you walk down and come line up over here, please? And also, and anybody else that does, you guys can just line up right where this young lady in the green t-shirt is. And and would you like to come up and ask your question? Yeah, I 
Great. All you can do is talk over here. Um, I was wondering where NASA, um, the location of NASA. Oh, where, where we're located. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are 10 centers, including our headquarters, which is in Washington, D.C. Um, I work at John C. Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. Uh, there is also a Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. We have Goddard in Maryland. Oh, goodness. Uh, Glenn Research Center up in Ohio. Ames Research Center out in California. We have JPL out in California. Um, White Sands in New Mexico. We have Wallops in Virginia. Uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida, Johnson Space Center in Houston. So we basically just about cover all the United States. Uh, we're all over the place and um, we work on different things at each one of these centers. We have our own specialties, but a lot of times our specialties are what bring us together. Right now for the space launch system, uh, not only am I wor working with people here at Stennis Space Center to get this testing uh, taken care of, but we are also working with folks up at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, to make this all come together. And also our uh, friends over at Michoud Assembly Facility outside New Orleans. So that's three groups working together um, over a little bit of a long distance. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I was wondering, okay, I was wondering what is the big deal about space? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'll have to speak from a personal standpoint on that. Um, the big deal about space is we are made to explore. And I'm not saying that we've explored every corner of the earth. There's still some depths of the oceans we haven't found. Um, I'm sure there's a few mountaintops we haven't climbed yet. Uh, but to a lot of people, um, space is the next step. Um, also, especially for like uh, the International Space Station, uh, there are new technologies that are actually developed in orbit that help us out here on planet Earth. Um, there is a medicine for osteoporosis that was actually um, part of the development was done studying the astronauts when they experience bone loss when they spend so much time up in orbit. So that helps people down here on Earth who experience osteoporosis help preventing that disease, uh, helping them out. Um, all the materials that we come up with, uh, like I mentioned on some of these other uh, technologies that we're coming up with, they're not just going to stay within the space industry. Um, some of these materials get used in fun things like tennis rackets and golf clubs. And some of these materials and technologies also get used in life-saving equipment for firefighters. Um, and for uh, police officers, uh, the Kevlar and all those different types of materials. Um, Velcro on some of your tennis shoes. Velcro was actually developed for the space program. So we get benefits here by going up there. So it's a big deal. That we get paid. <laughs> So we have another question. This one's from Facebook Live, and it is, how much fuel does it hold? And I don't know which one they're referring to. Okay. Um, hold on just a second. <laughs> I have to look that one up. <laughs> Ah, okay. The uh, the core stage, that's that large hydrogen tank and the oxygen tank, actually holds 2 million pounds of propellant. That's the oxygen, which is our oxidizer. Propellant is, um, is the hydrogen. Uh, for anything to burn, you need three things, right? You need fuel, 
you need oxygen or air, and you need an ignition source. Uh, the oxygen, we have to carry ourselves. We can't just use air, uh, not like a jet engine. Hydrogen is our fuel, and then our ignition source, it depends on the engine that we're using. Uh, sometimes it's just a glorified spark plug, and sometimes we use another uh, chemical means to start our engines. So we use the, the fire triangle to power our rocket engines. Thank you, Carla. Here's our next question. Go ahead. Yeah. Do you think at some point with technological advances, we'll be able to go beyond Mars? I hope so. That's the goal. Um, that's why we're going to send probes to Europa and Enceladus. Um, there's even talk of sending probes to Titan. Titan is another moon that's actually very closely, it, it kind of looks like Earth. It has uh, land masses. It has um, actually liquid methane on the surface that give it seas, oceans. Um, and we want to go there. We want to see it. Um, and check out those places. There's just so much we don't know yet. So yes, um, the plan is to go further than Mars, but Mars is gonna be our first, well, second step if you count going back to the moon. The moon will be our proving ground and then we'll go on to Mars. Thank you. You're welcome. So I was wondering why can't you bring normal food into space and what would happen um, if you bring it into space? And does it taste like the food on Earth? Um, well, it depends on what you mean by normal food. <laughs> um, if you're talking like just food that's on your plate, like, uh, I don't know, meatloaf or green beans or anything like that, um, in order for uh, us to be able to take it up with us into orbit, and I'll use the International Space Station as an example, uh, we actually have to take all the water out of it. Water is very heavy. Have you ever lifted up a gallon of water? It's, it's heavy. So we have to take out all the water. Um, it makes it a lot easier to transport it up to the International Space Station. They rehydrate it up there and then eat it like normal. Um, I've never asked an astronaut what the texture is like. Um, I've heard there are certain foods that are not the same. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. What um, what makes NASA think that life needs water? Okay, can you repeat the question? The video stopped. What if other extraterrestrial life, what if healthy or something? Can you repeat the question? The video stopped in, in the, between there. Um, what makes NASA think that life needs water? What if they uh, extraterrestrial life has adapted to other needs than what we think is like stuff that we would need? Um, actually, um, we do think that there might be different life forms that have adapted to other uh, extreme environments. Uh, we have examples of that in our own oceans. In some of the deep parts of our ocean, uh, we have animals and um, and mollusks and, and those types of things that are actually adapting to volcanic vents uh, with toxic levels of chemicals that we can you know we consider toxic and we can't live near. But these animals have adapted to that. So. We first look at water for signs of life, uh, but that's not going to be the only thing that we're going to look at. Um, like on Titan, there's land masses, um, they have methane oceans. There might, might be something inside those oceans. We have no idea. That's why we want to send probes to go find out. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you guys for asking all your questions and thanks everyone for coming. Thank you all on Facebook Live.
Um, so that concludes our presentation today. Let's all give Telekarma thank you. My pleasure. All right. So, I'm sorry, we ran out of time. However, um, if you want to see more like this, more virtual chats, feel free to visit our website and search distance learning. Uh, we can begin booking virtual visits so we can actually come into your classrooms and do something very similar to this. We have two programs that we're ready to get started with, and we hope we see everyone again soon. Thanks so much, and have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thank you.